What's the biggest secret about space? The true nature of dark matter and dark energy? The godhood lurking in the centre of the Milky Way, creating mysterious fresh stars just to write lewd jokes in a language we don't understand? No, it's that space is super boring. That's why astronauts going to space always state that the most marvellous thing about being there is seeing the Earth, and why NASA adds so many false colours to their deep space photos. Luckily, we've got a chance of remedying this situation by finding some funky exoplanets, which our machinic descendants can one day go poke. In this video, I'll show you the basics of searching for planets in NASA's imagery using Python and Lightcurve. I'll focus purely on the key steps to identify a potential planet transiting a star, first with a star we know has a planet, so that we know what we're looking for, and then by picking candidate stars from the TESS catalogue. There are many other resources out there that go into much more detail and can help you understand what's actually going on, and I'll stick those in the video notes. This is just a rocket speed tour to whet your appetite, so strap in and let's go. So here we have a Google Collaboratory notebook, which I created and you can copy and use as you like, containing all the code we'll be needing in this tutorial. At the start, we'll just install Lightcurve, which is a Python package allowing users to analyze time series data on the brightness of planets, stars, and galaxies. And then we'll import the key bits and bobs from Lightcurve as well as NumPy, just to get everything set up. And then we can get started actually analyzing a star that we know has a planet going around it. The basic idea, of course, is that if we see the luminosity of a star over time as tracked by one of these satellites, we can see it changing over time. And if there is something orbiting that planet periodically, we should be able to detect the diminishing and changing luminosity and then make some inferences on the nature of that planet. So that's what we'll do. We've got this thing called a pixel file. Uh, as long as we know the ID of this star that we want to look at, uh, we can try and access that pixel file, which contains a lot of snapshots of, of a pixel grid of luminosity of these stars. So here I have this example star, 6922244, from the Kepler satellite, which has been well analyzed. And we're going to assign that, find it, assign it to a variable, and then grab a single example frame from that and see what that looks like. So here's the result, frame number 42 from this pixel file, which is a 5 by 5 pixel grid in this case, showing different levels of luminosity when we're looking at the star. And there's lots and lots of these frames, of course, as the satellite observes the star over time, and that luminosity changes. Now, we don't want to be looking at these individual snapshots. What we can do instead is create a light curve, which combines the luminosity all over time. And that's what the light curve library is, of course, for. We can run this command to take the pixel file and create a curve from it. So we take the pixel file variable and run the to light curve method, and we apply an aperture mask, which makes the image look a bit better for our analysis purposes. And then we plot that, this plot command, I'm going to run it. We have other commands that are going to take us a bit deeper, and we'll go through these next. And what we see is this. So a chart of luminosity over time for that star. And we see something very interesting. First of all, we see these big spikes. So these big dips in luminosity. Well, this is very much indicative of something passing in front of the star, diminishing its luminosity. But we also see that the overall curve trends downwards for some reason. Unclear what that might be, but it can make analyzing this data a little bit uh, trickier than it needs to be. So the library, already has this flatten method, which we're going to run next. So if we run the flatten method and plot that, we're going to see a more stable, easier to analyze, more beautiful chart like this, where we don't see this general downward trend, but we still very clearly see some kind of periodicity. And we see that it's some days apart. We don't know exactly what that is. Okay, so what we can do then is what's called phase folding the light curve to get more information about an individual thing transiting in front of the star. So this puts basically those frequency spikes that we saw there on top of each other if we manage to get the periodicity right. Now we can run this command to assign a new variable, in this case folded LC. The flat LC 
uh, with the fold method, giving it a certain period value. So 3.5 days and a bit in this case. If we do that, we'll get this very beautiful and clear curve combining those spikes. And this is something that scientists can use to start making uh, determinations about the planet that's going around the star. So the depth of it might tell us something about the size of the planet and so on. But the tricky thing, of course, is finding that period. So we might visually estimate that it's something like three and a half days, but we really want to get it exactly right to get this phase folded curve to work. So to do that, we can take the next step, which is to create a periodogram, which are basically an estimate of the spectral density of a signal. And that's pretty easy to do as well with the tools we have available. And again, in the interest of just showing you how that's done, we can just pick a period, so between one and five days, and use the most common method, which is the box least squared squares method to create a periodogram. So pass the method choice, the period frequency factor, and plot that in. Um, we can also, and we do want to extract the period, the most prominent spike or peak in the periodogram, which we can access by getting at the period at max power property. So I'm going to assign that to what I'll call planet X period. So it's going to grab that highest peak because there might be multiple different ones and give a value for that, which we do see here as 3.5 to 2 and so on. So very close to what I'd put in there. Also some other variables we might find interesting, the transit time and the duration. So then we can take that period, which we know is what we kind of had here as we were cheating and looking ahead and do some other kind of folding if we want just to add another visual to our scanning, uh, a scatter plot might be more interesting or informative. So we'll just run a scatter method on top. I'm just printing these values here. So this implies the planet passes across the star for 0.1 days, for example. So what does that last folded view look like? It looks like this. So this is the scatter plot where the spikes information from those high peaks at that three and a half day interval have all been overlaid. And this is very good evidence that there's something very periodically going around the star and the depth and width of this curve is something that can be used to make some determinations about the planet. So there you go. If you find something like this in the stars that we'll be looking at, it will strongly suggest that there is a planet orbiting it. We know the basics now. Okay, but how do we actually go about finding planets on new stars? Well, here are the steps for that. So we need to pick a star and then get that data and start applying these steps at least. So what we can do is go to a website called MAST to access test data. That's what's being updated regularly at the moment here in 2022. And there are almost 10 million stars to look at. Whereas Kepler, the other satellite in this space, has its data set already very well analyzed. There might be stuff that we can still discover in the test data. So go to the MAST website and let's follow these steps. So we'll select the MAST catalogs here. We will choose the test CTL mission. We could choose test input and we'll select advanced search because we want to narrow down our search as we'll see, there's nine and a half million records, more or less. So I want to narrow it down by at least temperature and distance. And let's uh, set the distance in parsecs, something feasible, and let's set the temperature. I think we'll set something pretty low. Uh, the reason I'm thinking that is that the scanning period is uh, fairly rapid for TESS. Uh, so we might want to go for these red dwarfs that tend to have more rapidly orbiting planets. So maybe that will uh, increase our chances. But there are a lot of properties you can filter by. And then we'll search. And these are the stars that we find with this search. Here's the image. 
of any given star and we can then start looking at more information and see if there's a test data set that we can download. Uh, first, we might want to check whether that star has already been analyzed and a planet has been found. We can do that with this website called ExoMast. So if we take the ID and look at that code, we see that no planet's been found there yet, at least. Okay, so what do we do next? we need to access that data somehow. We put it here, just give it a tick prefix. And great, we see that there are test data sets. We can see that from this icon. And what we can then do is one of two things. We can either try and use our search target pixel file command to find it, which could work, but I'm finding often does not. Maybe the data hasn't been processed or we can take an extra step and download the data right locally into our um, working environment. So I've created a little download helper here at the bottom of the notebook where you can just find the product group ID and download file. So for here, I would pick uh, the product ID. You can find it in the details, product group ID paste it here, run that command, and Google Collaboratory will very rapidly download and unzip that file if it finds it. And great, we'll find something beautiful there. So it's downloaded the archive and it's extracted two files, the light curve already and the pixel file, the TP. So we'll take the path of that file, now that we've got that nicely downloaded, skip that and let's put it here in this method what does this do this looks at the pixel file here we'll look at a single frame for reference we'll do the steps that we did before this time for a star we haven't looked at before so i'll click that to run it we get the light curve we flatten it we try and find some kind of periodicity and then we might try and fold it Planet X period is what we want to run. So let's run that one more time. We do see there's a star. This is the 42nd frame of the scanning. Looks very different from our example data. I don't see any clear periodicity there. Nothing comes more clear to my eye when we're looking at the flattened version and neither do these further folding steps give more information. So we've looked at the star, at least with my skills, I'm seeing no progress. So we could take the next one. So let's do that one more time. We take a star ID from our search parameters, check it in ExoMast if a planet has been found. We look for that TIC ID specifically. We find test data, we can look at the details, grab the product group ID, use our little download helper to get those files, grab those, grab the pixel file, path, paste it in here, so we're pointing at the right thing and then run our little analyzer and see if we're hitting anything. Now, there's a few manual steps we've still got there. Maybe one, we would uh, automate that a bit more, but those are the basics, very basics. You're looking at a star that nobody might have looked at uh, before and trying to make sense of this light curve luminosity data. So maybe we've made space a little bit less boring now. If you're interested in this topic, do take a look at the video notes I'm posting a bunch more resources there. And do let me know if you've got any feedback on this video or any suggestions for future ones. Otherwise, have a great day and thanks for watching.